everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so I first heard about the promise of soil from a chef in Cleveland, and he's the kind of citizen who was always calling his legislators and their aides about any bills that he thought was going to adversely affect soil in uh, Oregon. And they were always saying to him, well, you're a chef. What do you care about soil? But he had grown up on, on, on an Ohio dairy farm in the 1940s, and he was convinced that food was only as healthy and as good as the soil that it grew in. So, and he wanted good food for his restaurant, so he was always agitating about those bills. And in the 1980s, he began to rebuild the pipeline of food from farms outside Cleveland into the city and to serve his customers only local food. And we became friends, and we talked a lot about how food should be grown. And about seven years ago, he told me about a bunch of farmers that he was buying from who were talking about this thing called carbon farming. And the idea was to grow food while also growing the amount of carbon that was in the soil. Instead of releasing soil carbon and allowing it to become carbon dioxide, which is what most agriculture does. Um, and they were doing this with really simple practices, like using cover crops and disturbing the soil as little as possible, going no-till, introducing biodiversity to their fields bringing back animals on the farm and uh, grazing those animals very carefully. So this chef was really excited uh, about all this because soil with more carbon is more fertile and produces healthier and more delicious food, he felt. And I was excited because I saw that connection between that kind of farming, the kind of farming, carbon farming, that builds carbon in the soil, and climate. It seemed to me that if agriculture worldwide adopted, embraced carbon farming, that a lot of carbon would be removed from the atmosphere and tucked away in the soil. And for the first time ever, I became hopeful that we could solve this huge problem that we've created, you know, this terrible threat to our planet, which is global warming. There are four billion acres of crops around the world and 14 billion acres of pastures and rangeland and what if all of them were pulling in carbon and storing it in the soil instead of adding more carbon to that legacy load um, of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere? You know, what if there is a win-win approach to what seems to always be a clash between agriculture and environment? So I started interviewing all sorts of people about soil, and, and, and they started talking a lot about how soil is alive um, and even though I've been a gardener all my adult life and my parents were crazy avid gardeners and my grandparents and my great-grandparents were farmers, I had no idea how alive soil is. I don't think most of us do. When I heard the phrase life in the soil, I figured that they were talking about earthworms and beetles, but I came to understand that those are like the leviathans of the soil. Those are like the great blue whales and the giant squids. Um, it's what we don't see in the soil that makes it so incredibly alive. The fungi and the bacteria and the protozoa and the tiny nematodes, these tiny, tiny life forms that are busy in the soil working with plants. They've been there a long time before us and these other life forms in the soil evolved and they're crucial to the planet functioning as one big ecosystem and we're key to this beautiful lush world developing at all and there are billions of them in a teaspoon of soil. So the recognition of soil microorganisms' importance by both scientists and farmers is pretty new, and I think it's, it's very much like the recognition that we now have about the microbial communities in our own bodies. You know, our bodies contain roughly as many bacterial cells, 30 trillion bacterial cells, as human cells. We have 40 trillion human cells. Um, and then there's uncounted more yeasts and viruses and other tiny things living in us and on us. And scientists think that that human microbiome is, is crucial to our bodies functioning properly. It's crucial to our digestion and our metabolism and our immune system and even to the way our brains function. And just as people are starting to understand uh, the importance of that microbial population in our body, we have to get to that point with soil. Um, we need everyone from ordinary people to policymakers to understand that Earth's microbiome is even more dense and diverse and essential. The only way we can live on this planet without destroying it is if we learn how to live in harmony with that vast 
invisible but incredibly uh, important mass of micro microorganisms that are in the soil and everywhere. And that's essentially what these carbon farmers are doing. They understand the carbon cycle, that plants perform this great um, biological miracle of pulling um, carbon dioxide from the air and turning that into a carbon fuel that they build, that they grow with. Um, and they also share up to half of that carbon fuel with these microorganisms in the soil. And in exchange, those symbionts in the soil bring plants nutrients and perform lots of other services for them. And these farmers are understanding that um, part of that formerly at atmospheric carbon um, stays in the soil, that it gets tucked away in the soil by these microorganisms. And that's why the virgin soils of the Great Plains, for instance, were so dark and rich and fertile, is that that process had been going on for millions of years. So these carbon farmers have learned how to support that process of carbon, um, of, of putting carbon naturally in the soil. They've learned to support that process. Um, even though mu much of today's agriculture, you know, subverts that process. And in case you get the idea that I'm just talking about farmers with a couple of acres, even though those guys are great, there are farmers with thousands of acres who are doing this. Um, and they've taken up carbon farming. And they found that they're not just successful ecologically and environmentally. They often have higher production than their neighbors and lower costs because they use fewer chemicals and fuel. And I really think that they are our planet's hope for the future. Because even if we stop all fossil fuel emissions right now, this very minute, the legacy load of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is just going to keep warming the planet. We, we need to draw down that legacy load and no one can do it better than farmers who have figured out how to work with the natural processes and the microbes in their, on their land. It's really important for those of you who are involved with policy to support and expand their work and remove the roadblocks because we don't have to accept the false dichotomy that we can have good food or enough food, uh, healthy agriculture or productive agriculture. These carbon farmers are showing us that we can have um, good food, good agriculture, and healthy landscapes. Um, because the soil really will save us if we give it a chance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. Our next, speaker, our next speaker is Dr. Chris Nichols, Chief Scientist at the Rodale Institute. Dr. Nichols has a PhD in soil science and worked as a soil microbiologist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture for 14 years. At the Rodale Institute, she examines the impacts of crop and livestock management on soil health. 